all places. So tonight's topic is called God's Army. God's Army. It's going to be a relatively short class. I'm not going to be long-winded with this one. Okay? All praise to the Most High. Let's open up with the book of Ecclesiastes, 39 verse 26. You might be wondering, why is he going there? Sirach 39 verse 26. Watch this. Stay in spirit. Okay? Let's read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 39 verse 26. Come on. The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water, mm -hmm. fire, iron, and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape, and oil and clothing. So now these are the principal things of, it says the principal things for the whole use of man's life. Meaning these are basic necessities that we need in the lens of our captivity. You understand? Water, fire, iron. Okay, water, fire, iron, and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and blood of the grape. Okay, that's strong drink going, in, going into that. And oil and clothing. These are the things that we need to survive on a daily basis. You understand? Go ahead. Verse 27. Verse 27. Mm -hmm. All these things are for good to the godly. So to the sinner, they are turned into evil. So these things, these basic things that we need in life, it says they are good to the godly, but to the sinners, they are turned into evil. Because why? We, have a, we are covetous. That's why they are turned into evil. But watch this. Give me Sarah 29, 21. Sarah 29, verse 21. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 29, verse 21. Mm -hmm. The chief thing for life is water mm -hmm. and bread and clothing and a house to cover shame. So he's repeating himself once again. The chief thing for life is water. You understand? Bread and clothing and a house to cover shame. These are basic needs. You understand? A lot of the times we want more. We just want more stuff. But the Lord is giving us, listen, this is, if you just want to enjoy yourself, listen, just keep it simple. Don't complicate life. Okay? Watch this. Give me the book. Give me the book of, um, before we get there, before we get there. Give me the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. In the Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to start at verse... We're going to start at verse 4. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 4. Let's read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 4. Go ahead. I made me great works. Mm -hmm. I builded me houses. Come on. I planted me vineyards. Read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 4. Mm -hmm. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. So now this is King Solomon speaking because he is explaining to us how to enjoy your life. I'm getting, I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, come on, keep going. Verse five. Mm -hmm. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. Because guess what? Remember now, these things they are they are what they are they are good for man. You understand? These things are good for men to use. These are basic things that you, you need in life to enjoy your life. You understand? Go ahead. I made me pools of water mm -hmm. to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. So now he was, he, he was making you, he had a garden. He planted all type of fruits that he, could, he wanted. Go ahead. I got me servants and maidens mm. and had servants born in my house. Come on. Also, I had also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. So now he's telling you the possessions that he's got. Okay, these are the basic things in life. We, remember, he was a king, but I'm trying to show you that these are the basic things in life. You understand? He says, I made me pools of water. What is necessary? Okay, come on. I gathered me also silver and gold. Hmm. And the peculiar treasure, and the peculiar treasure of kings, and of provinces, read, and of the provinces, I get me men, men singers and women singers, 
mm. and the delights of the sons of men Come as on. musical instruments and that and that of all sorts. So he's telling you, sir, he gathered silver, he gathered gold, peculiar treasures of kings, okay, and of the provinces. I get me men singers and women singers. And the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So he was really enjoying his life. Okay, come on, watch this. Go ahead. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Come on. Also, my wisdom remained with me. You see what he's saying right there? He says, also, not only that, but my wisdom that the Lord put upon him, he says, it remained with him. Go ahead. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. Mm -hmm. I withheld not my heart from any joy. Stop right there. What did he say? I withheld not my heart from any joy. Who doesn't want to have a joyful spirit? Everybody wants that. He says, I, with, I withheld not my heart from any joy. Go ahead. I withheld not my heart from any joy. Come on. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. You see that part right there? That's the part I want to touch on. It says, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. You must rejoice in all your labors. You understand? Go ahead. And this was my portion of all my labor. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Because when you labor, the Lord will give you a portion that is just. Watch this. Give me Ecclesiastes now. Chapter 2. Read verse 24 now. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 24. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 24. Mm -hmm. There is nothing better for a man than, the, than that he should eat and drink. And that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Mm -hmm. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Read that again, verse 24. Read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. Come on. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink. And that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Come on. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. You see, you see what he's saying? It says, you must what? He says, it says, there's nothing better for a man than that, than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Because you are laboring, you understand? And honest labor. Watch this. Give me Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 12. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12. Go ahead. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Mm. whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. But the abundance, he says, the abundance of the rich is not going to allow him to sleep. But he says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Whether he eat little or much is sweet. Now, go back. Go back to Ecclesiastes 2.24 again. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. Read. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. So you must enjoy. Yeah, we're in captivity. That's why the Lord has created all these high holidays for us to forget a little bit that we're in captivity. But King Solomon was not in captivity at this point. You understand? He was in the kingdom. Watch this. Give me that in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 7 now. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 7. Mm -hmm. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. Mm. For God now accepted thy works. You see that thing? So the most I saw God is not saying, don't enjoy yourself in this truth. You must have joy. You must have that spirit of joy, even in captivity. You understand? But I'm getting somewhere with this. So just stay with me. Give me Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13. Go ahead. And also that every man should eat and drink mm. and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Read it again, read it again, verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13. And also that every man should eat and drink 
and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Now watch this. You see, he says, you must enjoy the fruit of your labors. He says, it is the gift of God. Give me Ecclesiastes chapter, jump down to verse 22. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. Mm. For that is his portion. Come on. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? So now, what I'm showing you here is that King Solomon, that's when he recovered himself. That's why he wrote this book. Now, he was still in the kingdom. You understand? He was still in the kingdom and he was enjoying all of these things. Now, watch this. I'm going to show you something. Go back to Sirach now, 29 verse 21. Go back there. Let's read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 21. Come on. The chief thing for life is water and mm. bread and clothing and in house to cover shame. And in house to cover shame. So these are the basic things we need in life, right? Go back to Sirach 39 26. I want to read that again. I don't want you to lose the thought. Okay. Come on. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 26. The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water, fire, iron, and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape, mm. and oil and clothing. And oil and clothing. Go ahead. Verse 27. All these things are good to the godly. So to the sinners... They are turned into evil. Now watch this. It says to the sinners, they are turned into evil. That's the part I want to deal with. Because so far, everything we read, is, these are the basic things that a man, and a, a man needs. You need these things. You can't live without these things because these are needs. They are not wants. They are needs. Watch this. Give me the book of Sirach chapter 40. Sirach 40 and verse 28. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 40, verse 28. My son, lead not a beggar's life, mm. for better it is to die than to beg. Now, watch this. You see what he's saying? He says, don't, leave a, don't lead a beggar's life. It is better to die than to beg, right? Go ahead. The life of him that dependeth on another man's table mm. is not to be counted for a life. For he polluted himself with other men's meat. But a wise man, well-nurtured, will be where they rob. He says, but a wise man, well-nurtured, will be where they rob. A wise man. A wise man is going to be grieved by this stuff. A wise man is going to be grieved by this type of lifestyle. Read verse 29 again. Ecclesiastes chapter, four, Ecclesiasticus, chapter 40, verse 29. Mm -hmm. The life of him that dependeth on another man's table is not to be counted for life. Read. He polluted himself with other men's meat, but a wise man, well nurtured, will be where thereof. So now, next verse, come on. Verse 30. Mm -hmm. The life of him that depends. Verse 30. Begging is sweet in the mouth of the shameless, mm. but in his belly, they shall burn a fire. Now, now, the most high God is commanding. You see what the most high God, the most high God is struggling our spirit right here. You understand? He wants to get to our spirit. He wants to get to our mind. He says, listen, you need to stop leading a beggar's life because it's better to, to die than to beg. Now watch this, right? Hmm. Give me the book of, remember he said in Sirach 36, 39, he says, all these things are for, are, are, uh, for good to the godly, but to the sinners, they are turned into evil. To the sinners, these basic necessities in life, they are turned into evil. Watch this. Give me the book of Deuteronomy 28. Okay, 47. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Come on. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. The abundance of all things, the example of those abundance of all things is what we read in Sirach 39, Sirach 29, you understand? What we read in Ecclesiastes. Those are the abundance of all things. Those, some of them. 
You understand? Read that again. Verse 47. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Read. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. So the key here is says because we did not want to serve the most high God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. What did the Lord do to us? Next verse. Come on. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies mm. which the Lord shall send against thee. So now, because we did not want to serve the most high God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, now we are going to serve our enemies for these things, for the joyfulness and the gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. We're going to have to serve our enemies to get these things. That's what Moses is teaching us here. Read verse 48 again. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48. Go ahead. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee. Mm -hmm. in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness Come and on. in want of all things. Stop right there. And he... So now, hold on. The Lord says, because we did not want to serve him, you understand, with joyfulness and gladness of heart, now we're going to serve our enemies for, for what? For joyfulness and gladness of heart. Now we're going to have to depend on our enemies instead of the Lord. Remember what we read in Sarah 40. Okay? It says, we're going to serve our enemies in hunger. The basic things in life we read in Sarak 39, in Sarak 29, you understand? In hunger, for food. These are the basic, th basic things for, for use of man's life. Hunger, you understand? And in text, water, natural resource, we're going to have to go to our enemies for these things. You understand? And, and in nakedness, for clothes. Remember it says what? Go back to Sarak 39. Sarak 39, verse 26. Because it's mentioned clothing there. I believe it's mentioned clothing. There's it mentioned clothing. Yeah, it definitely does. You know what? Read, read 39, 26. Um, yeah, 39, 26. Read it. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 39, verse 26. Come on. The principal thing for the whole use of man's life are water, fire, Hold on. Our water. We just read in Deuteronomy 28 that in thirst, we're going to have to go to our enemies for these things. You understand? And these are the basic things for the whole use of man's life. Water. Now we have to go to our enemies for thirst. You want water, you must go to them. Go ahead. Our water, fire, iron, and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape. That, that's oil. in thirst. That's in thirst. So it says fire that goes into what? Electricity today. You understand? The fire goes into electricity. The water, you understand? Fire. Okay. Iron. Salt. That's the things that you eat now. Flour of the wheat. Honey. Milk. The blood of the grape. That in thirst for things that you need to drink, whether it be water or, or, or wine or strong drink, you must go to them. Go ahead. And the blood of the grape and oil and clothing. You see that thing? And oil, which is part of what you eat, and clothing. In nakedness, you must go to your enemies. For clothes, you must go to them. So the most that God is showing us something here. Or say, listen, you have to be embarrassed by this thing. When you wake up to this truth, you must be embarrassed by this thing. You must be mad as hell. You understand? is that this whole time when we be begging for basic things is not natural for us. For us, it's not natural. For the other nations, that's a natural thing because they were created to be servants on this earth. But for us, that's not natural. It's unnatural for us to be begging. That's what the Lord is showing us right here. Go back to Deuteronomy 28, verse 48 again. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48. Go ahead. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, mm -hmm. in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness. Come on. And in, and in want of all things. Anything you lack, want goes into lack. Everything, anything and everything you lack, you must go to them. Because remember it says we are going to serve our enemies and in want of all things also. 
All this jump down to verse 64. This is how we're going to save our enemies. Watch this. In want of all things. This goes into in want of all things. Read that. Verse 64. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64. Read. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from, one, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So now because we are saving, we are, we are, we are, we are, because of our sins, we're going to be scattered among these nations. We're going to serve them for hunger, for thirst and nakedness and want of all things. That want of all things, it goes into what? We're going to serve their idols as well. That's the wood and the stone. The wood goes into the Christianity. The stone goes into Islam because those are the two major religions on this earth. Christianity be on top, then followed by Islam. You understand? Worshipping of a black rock called Allah. Now, that goes into in one of all things. Religion, they're going to teach us that. You understand? Economics, we're going to have to go to them. Education, we must go to them for all of these things, which falls under one of all things. Now go back to Deuteronomy 28, verse 48, once again. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48. Read. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, Read. in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. So our enemies will put chains on our necks and our ankles and our wrists until we are destroyed, until none of those things are necessary because the chains will be in our minds, in our spirits. Watch this. Give me Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 19. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 19. Read that. Second book of Chronicles chapter 7, verse 19. Read but if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them. So now serving other gods and worshiping them is because of what we, what we have done or did not do. We did not keep God's commandments because you know, he says, and forsake my statutes and my commandments. The reason why we ended up saving other gods in this land, South Africa, the Congo, and what, wherever we are scattered, is because we forsook the statutes and the commandments of the Most High God. That's why we went to worship other gods. Go ahead. Verse 20. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them. That's the land of Jerusalem. That's the land of Jerusalem. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of the land which I have given them. That's the land of Jerusalem. You understand? Come on. And this house, mm -hmm. which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my seat and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. So now watch this. Give me the book of Luke 21 verse 24 because this is what this is going into. Okay, Luke 21, 24, read that. When we, were kicked, when we were kicked out of our homeland, when the Most High God plucked us up by the roots. Watch this, Luke 21, 24. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Mm -hmm. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. You see that part right there? and shall be led away captive into all nations. That's when the Lord says, I'm going to pluck you up by the roots. You understand? I'm going to take you out of the land that I've given you. Go ahead. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Jerusalem will be inhabited by somebody else until their time of rulership is over. You understand? Go back. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 20 again. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 20. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them. Mm -hmm. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. 
So now the Lord, because we did not want to keep his, we forsook his ways and his statutes and his commandments, the Lord kicked us out of Jerusalem. You understand? We went into captivity. That's the same thing that Christ was explaining to us in Luke 21. You understand? Because guess what? For the abundance of all things, like Solomon or King Solomon is explaining in Ecclesiastes, we lost those abundance of all things. We lost them all. You understand? We lost them all. And now we are beggars now. You understand? Now we are begging. We are begging now. Go ahead. Verse 21. And this house, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it. Come on. So that he shall say, why had the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? The land and the house, it goes into the land of Jerusalem. The house is the house of Israel. Go ahead. And it shall be answered, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, mm. which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, hath he brought all this evil upon them. So you see what he's saying right there? Because we, we did not want to keep the commandments of the Most High God, we went into other gods. Now, the heathens, they be asking themselves, so what happened? Somebody asked, the heathens will know exactly what happened here. And even though Amalek, Jewish people in our land, you understand? They know exactly why we are not in our homeland this day. Even the Arabs that they say that's their land, they know why we are not in that land. Because we broke God's commandments. We took hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. You understand? And that's why the Lord brought all this great evil upon us. Because of rebellion against his commandments. Now, we are beggars now. Okay? Now, go back to Sarah 40 verse 28 again. Ecclesiastes chapter 40 verse 28. Read. My son, lead not a beggar's life. Mm-hmm. For better it is to die than to beg. You see that thing? Don't lead a beggar's life because right now we're beggars. And how did we become beggars? Because we broke God's laws. So now you have to really think about it and say, listen, wait a minute. I was in the world and I didn't understand why we just be begging for everything. You're begging for a job. You understand? You're begging for a raise. You're begging for a day off. Like I'm just using these carnal examples because that's what's going on. You're begging for those things. You begging to take leave because your child is sick. You see, you see that thing? We are beggars now because why? For the abundance, because we did not want to serve the most high God with joyfulness and gladness of heart. For the abundance of those things, the things that King Solomon is explaining, you understand? Guess what? The most high God he says, You're gonna lead a beggar's life now. But the Lord comes back and says, Listen, don't lead a beggar's life. Meaning the Lord is telling us, what is he saying to us? There's a way to come out of this thing. You have to be mad enough to say, you know what? I need to come out of this thing. Just think about it. Okay. Verse 28 again. Ecclesiastes chapter 40 verse 28. Ray. My son, lead not a beggar's life. Mm. For better it is to die than to beg. Come on. Verse 29. Verse 29. Mm -hmm. The life of him that dependeth on another man's table is not to be counted for a life. For he polluteth himself with other men's meat. But a wise man, well nurtured, will beware thereof. So now it says a life of him that dependeth on another man's table is not to be counted for a life. Because this is not living. The way we live, this is not living. We are the mightiest nation on this earth. The greatest people on the planet earth. You understand? We are the sons of God. And guess what? The sons of look what the sons of God are doing now. Beggars. We be begging for everything. For water. You beg for water. You beg for food. You beg for clothing. You beg for shelter. You beg for a job. You begging for everything. You begging for your life on a daily basis. You understand? And we're going to beg to the same people that enslaved us. Really have to think about that thing. You understand? So the Lord is like, listen, you, you okay living like this? Because that's what the Moses is saying. Don't need a beggar's. Why are you living a beggar's life like this? Why are you begging? There's no need for you to beg. 
I gave you everything, but you are still begging. What is wrong with y'all? That's what the Lord is really saying to us. But you see, we don't get it. Okay, come on. Verse 30. Verse 30. Begging is sweet in the mouth of the shameless. Mm. But in his belly, they shall burn a fire. So now it says begging is sweet in the mouth of the shameless. Because if you are shameless, you're going to be begging. You're going to be a beggar. Now look at us as a people, the mightiest nation on earth. We beggars now. The Lord says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake you up now. I'm going to wake you up. Now that you are woken up, what are you doing about it now, now that you've woken up? Are you going to continue to go into the same sin over and over? No. You have to step up your game and keep God's commandments so we can build up and go back home. That's the only reason why we're doing this. We want to go home. We want to go back to our homeland. We want to go back to our, that royal status that the Lord gave unto us. You understand? Watch this. Sirach 21. Sirach 21 verse 8. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 21 verse 8. Mm -hmm. He that buildeth his house with other men's money is like, is like one that gathereth himself stones for the tomb of his burial. Now that's heavy right there. The Lord is saying he that buildeth his house with other men's money is like one that gathereth himself the stones for the tomb of his burial. Meaning what? You just you are digging your own burial for your own death, doing that. You're just as good as dead. That's why in Sirach 40, it says, it is better to die than to beg. Because as long as you are depending on another man's table, guess what? That's a shameless life. That's a shameful life. So it says, it, it's better to die. So now, but it says, a wise man that is well-natured will be where they're off. Now watch this. Give me the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 20. Because the most high God is a man of war. Give me that before you get that. Give me Exodus 15, verse Exodus 15. Give me that thing. Okay, Exodus 15, verse 3. We need to understand the type of God we're dealing with. You understand? Read that. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. Mm -hmm. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a what? The Lord is a man of war. The Lord, the most high God is a man of war. The Lord loves war. He loves that thing. Okay, come on. The Lord is his name. The Lord is his name. The most high God, he is a man of war. And he's a man. You understand? Watch this. Now give me Judges 2 verse 20. Let me show you how much the most high God loves war. He loves war so much that he did this to us. Watch this. Judges chapter 2 verse 20. You're going to read down. The book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 20. Go ahead. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Mm -hmm. And he said, because that this people had transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. So now the Most High God is angry. That's why we are here now, living a beggar's life. That's why we're here now. We live like beggars. Not like beggars. We be begging for everything. Like we read in Deuteronomy 28, Sirach 39, 26. You understand? Sirach 29, 21. Those are basic things in that we are begging for those things. So now because we, 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 we broke his commandments, now we are beggars. But the Lord says, listen, I'm going to wake you up. Now that you are, awake, you, are, you are awake now, you are illuminated with the gospel of Christ, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to still be complaining? Okay. Read verse 21. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So now Joshua, because Joshua didn't destroy all the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, he didn't destroy them all because the Lord made sure that Joshua did not. Why? For our sake, to teach us war. You understand? Because the Lord is going to leave, he left, he, he's leaving these nations among us so we can see how they live. We see how life is easy for them. And now when you come into the Bible, you start to realize the reason why they are living this lavish lifestyle is because of our sins. That's supposed to make you mad. And so you mean to tell me these nothings are ruling over me because of what I did? So when that enters into your mind, guess what? You, now you get mad. Guess what? When you get mad, you open this Bible, you apply it. You understand? Because the Mosai is a master strategist. 
You understand? He's a strategist of war. Understand that? Read it again. Verse 21. Judges, chapter 2, verse 21. Mm -hmm. I also will not henceforth drive out any from them, any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Next verse, come on. That through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their, father, as their fathers did keep it or not. So now the Lord is saying that I'm leaving these nations from among you. Why? Because I'm trying to prove you, to prove Israel to see whether they will keep my ways or not. So because what, what needs to happen for the Lord to prove you? The Lord will make sure that these nations oppress you. Now, while you are being oppressed, while you are feeling depressed, you feel there's no way out, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to wake you up. Now what you're going to do now that you know the word now? What are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and fold your arms, feel sorry for yourself? Because the Lord don't like that type of spirit. When you feel so sorry for yourself, the Lord will put you to death. Go ahead. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. The Lord did not deliver these nations that he left to prove us with. He, didn't, he, 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 did, not, he did not deliver them into the hand of Joshua for a reason. You understand? Judges 3 verse 1 now. Watch this. Judges chapter 3 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So Israel did not know, has not known all the wars of Canaan, right? Because there were kids that were growing up. They didn't know the wars that happened before their time. So now the Lord says, I'm going to leave these Canaanites. You understand? Because I want to make sure that Israel learns war. They learn how to fight. You understand? Come on. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. To do what? Uh, to teach them war. To teach them war. To teach them war. To teach them war. Because the Moses God is a man of war. He is leaving these nations on purpose. So that we can learn how to fight back. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a book of war, the Bible. I'm going to give you the book of war, the, the greatest sword, the sharpest sword on this earth is this Bible. He says, I'm going to give you a weapon of war. Now that you have it, what are you going to do? These nations, the, the way they live among us, everything is all good. They are doing, the Lord is allowing them to live like that. To what? To force you to enroll into God's army and learn how to fight. Understand that thing. Read that thing again. Verse 2. Judges chapter 3 verse 2. Go ahead. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least, such as before, knew nothing thereof. Because you see what? The Lord is doing this so what? To make sure that we learn how to fight. Because if you look at these nations, they don't give a damn about God's laws. Watch this. Give me second Ezra chapter 6, verse 56. Because the Lord keeps leaving these clues in the Bible to show us the people that are ruling over us. And Israel is still taking a chill pill. They are not moving with the spirit of haste. Watch this. Second Ezra chapter 6, verse 56. Read that. Second Ezra chapter 6, verse 56. Go ahead. As for the other people, which also come of Adam, thou hast said that they are nothing, but be like unto spittle, mm. and as like in the abundance of them unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. So the Lord is giving you the is is is, is showing us the extent of how these nations compared to us, they are nothing. You understand? That's why it's left in the book, so we know. That's why he left, he left it in the book and he left these nations around us. So once you discover it, you're going to say, you know what? I'm tired of being ruled by these heathens. Guess where you're going to go? You're going to pick up the sword so you can learn how to fight. You understand? Come on. And now, O oh Lord, behold, these heathen, which have ever been reputed as nothing, have begun to be lords over us mm. and to devour us. 
They are lords over us and they are devouring us with their what? With their political system, with their religious systems, with their economic systems. They are devouring us. You understand? Watch this. Give me uh, 2 Ezra 3, verse 31. Listen to what Ezra is saying right here. Okay, come on. 2 Ezra chapter 3, verse 31. Read. I do not remember how this way may be left. Are they then of Babylon better than they of Zion? Because at this point, remember now, Ezra is seeing a vision, okay? So now he's asking the Lord, he says, are they, uh, he says, are they then of Babylon better than they of Zion? Because the, 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 the Cushites, the Chaldeans, you understand? They were living large and they did not mind the laws of God at all. And I want to show you something. I mentioned some things that the reason why you see the nations are prospering is because our, our, we, we have sinned against the, the Lord our God. Now watch this. Second Ezra chapter 3, read verse 1. You know what? Read verse 2. Let's just get to verse 2. Get to the point. Read verse 2. Second Ezra 3 verse 2. Read that. Second Ezra chapter 3 verse 2. Mm -hmm. For I saw the desolation of Zion. Stop right there. And what did you see? For I saw the desolation of Zion. So Ezra is saying, listen, I've seen the desolation of Zion. Zion is desolate. Now watch this. Watch what happens. Look at, the, look at what happens when, when Zion is desolate. Look at how the nations live. Read on. Come on. And the wealth of them that dwelt at Babylon. You see that, you see that thing right there? When Zion is desolate, the other nations, they flow in wealth. They are not flowing in wealth because we are weak. No. They are flowing in wealth because we have sinned against the Lord our God. That's why they are flowing in wealth. Look at America today. Look at Europe. Look at China. Look at India. Look at Saudi Arabia. How are these nations flourishing and prospering? It's because Zion is desolate. That's why they are able to flourish and flow in wealth. Because we have sinned against the Lord our God. You understand? Go back. Read verse 31 again now. Second is chapter 3, verse 31. Uh -huh. I do not remember how this way may be left. Are they then of Babylon better than they of Zion? Come on. Or is there any other people that knoweth thee beside Israel? Or what generation had so believed thy covenant as Jacob? You see, the Ezra is asking the question Is there any other people that knoweth thee beside Israel? Or what generation has so believed their covenants as Jacob? None. Go ahead. And yet their reward appeared not. Meaning Zion's reward does not appear. That's what Ezra is saying. Come on. And their labor hath no fruit. Mm -hmm. For I have gone here and there through the heathen. And I see that they flow in wealth. And think not upon their commandments. You see what Ezra is saying? He says, I've gone here and there. I mean, you, you've seen, you go to Santin, you go to um, Pretoria, you go to uh, uh, Waterfall, Cape Town, wherever. These nations, they are flowing in wealth. You understand? And think not upon the commandments of the Mosai. On Saturday, Saturday, they look forward to Saturday. Not the same way we look forward to it. They look forward to Saturday because they are going to be shopping. They are going to be going to, be going to restaurant, buying, selling, all of that stuff, all of which is against the laws of God. They look forward to that day for that particular reason. It's not by accident, it's by design. You understand? Watch this. Give me the book of Nehemiah 9 verse 36. Because it says, the heathen, they flow in wealth and they don't think about the commandments of the Most High God at all. Watch this. Nehemiah 9 verse 36. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 36. Go ahead. Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. Meaning we are yet, we are still, we are yet this, we are yet this day in our captivity. You understand? In Yamaya saying the same thing that Baruch says. Go ahead. Verse 37. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. So now as uh, Nehemiah is telling us, listen, 
these kings they flow in wealth they it says the land that is produced has so much fruits resources and all that you understand it says it yielded much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins so what Ezra is going over is the same thing that Nehemiah is complaining about you understand because of our sins go ahead also they have dominion over our bodies now that's heavy right there. They have, do they have dominion power over our bodies. How do they have power over our bodies? We read it in Deuteronomy 28 verse 48. Because our bodies, they need drink, they need clothing, they need food, they need, they need to be educated, they need shelter, the basic things in life. But they provide that. So they have power over our bodies. Go ahead. And, and over our cattle. Mm-hmm. At their pleasure, and we are in great distress. At their pleasure, we are in great distress. That's the same thing we read in Nehemiah last night. You understand? When Nehemiah was complaining in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 16, uh, 17 down. Now, go back to uh, Second Esdras chapter 3. Read verse 33 again. Second Esdras chapter 3, verse 33. Mm -hmm. And yet their reward appeared not, and their labor hath no fruit. For I have gone here and there through the heathen, and I see that they flow in wealth, and think not upon thy commandments. They don't think about God's laws. Go ahead. Weigh thou therefore our wickedness now in the balance, and theirs also that dwell in the world. Meaning the and heathens. So shall th when it says, and theirs also that dwell in the world as the heathens, Go ahead. And so, and so shall thy name nowhere be found but in Israel. It says your name is not going to be found anywhere else but in Israel. And yet they are still flowing in wealth. They are lost over us and they are devouring us. Go ahead. Or oh, when was it that they which dwell upon the earth have not sinned in thy sight? Or what people have so kept thy commandments? Read. Thou shalt find that Israel by name hath kept thy precepts, but not the heathen. But not the heathen. It says, thou shalt find that Israel by name hath kept thy precept, but not the heathen. So the Lord is teaching us, is, listen, he said, listen, the Israel has kept thy name, but not the heathen. They kept thy precept, not the heathen. But yet they are still flowing in wealth. Whose fault is that? That's our fault. Nehemiah explained it in Nehemiah 937. It's our fault because of our sins. You understand? Because of our sins. Now watch this. Give me. Give me the book of Deuteronomy 28. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 34. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 34. Read. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which mm. thou shalt see. Because right now, the Lord is saying, you shall, meaning future prophecy, which is happening right now. Read that again. We shall be what? So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. You're going to be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Because the Lord is going to allow you to see how these nations, they flow, in, they flow and flourish in wealth. And you're going to be mad when you see it because now you know the truth of why they are flowing in wealth. You're going to be mad as hell. You understand? Now, jump up to verse 33. Verse 33. The fruits of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. So now because the fruit of your lands are going to be taken by another nation of people, the Europeans, you understand, the, the, the Ishmaelites, the Chinese and so forth, the Americans, guess what? It says, shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. So when you are oppressed, meaning always oppressed, always crushed, when you try to rise up. You understand? So it says, that's, what, that's what the reason why you're going to be mad. Because you're going to see it with your own eyes. The Lord, I'm going to make you see it. I'm going to make sure you see this thing go down. Now that you have my word, give me Ecclesiastes now. 
You know what? Before you get there, jump, jump, jump up, jump down to verse 51. Deuteronomy 28, verse 51. Deuteronomy 28, verse 51. Mm -hmm. and, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. You see that thing? Hold on. He will eat the fruit of thy cattle. Because remember when the, 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 the Jan van Riebeck, the Portuguese and all of that, well, when they took the fruit of our cattle, they took our cattle. You understand? Because they, our cattle, our flocks were multiplying. They took all of that. Okay, come on. And he shall eat the fruits of thy cattle mm -hmm. and the fruits of thy land. And the fruit of thy land. So the fruit of our cattle is what? Because we had land. The white man came and colonized us and kicked us out of our home, our, our, our lands. You understand? And out of our houses, if you read Micah 2. But what you want to see here is the fruit of our land goes into land because what do the cows eat? What do they eat? They eat grass and so forth. That means you have to have land so you can feed them. You have to have water to water the grass. The Lord will bring rain and so forth. Okay? Read that part again, verse 51. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 51. Mm -hmm. And he shall eat the fruits of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land. That's the gold, the diamond, that... the silver. Hold on. The fruit of our land that goes into the gold, the silver, the diamond, the uranium, the oil. You understand? And so forth. Go ahead. Until thou be destroyed. Until we're destroyed. Are we not destroyed now? Yes. We are destroyed as a people. We are impoverished right now. Go ahead. Until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn Stop right wine. there. I'm going to show you how that when, the, when this man comes, when this, this race of people come, that's the white man, you understand? When they come, it says what? We shall not leave, you shall not leave the either corn. He's not going to leave you corn. Because remember, the, where does the corn grow? It grows on the land. He's going to take the land that grows the corn. That means you are left with nothing. Okay, come on. Either corn, wine, or oil, mm -hmm. or the increase of thy kind, the cattle, or flocks, mm -hmm. or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. So they're gonna take everything from us, our resources. You understand? Because a cattle is a resource. Your sheep, your goat, those are resources. By the way, your asses, your donkeys, and stuff, those are resources. They're going to take it. You're not going to be able to do nothing about it. Read verse 31. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 31. Read. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, mm. and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, mm. and shall not be restored unto thee, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue thee. That's exactly what has happened. That's why today you see your EFF, they, are, they, they say land. BLM, they say black first, land first. BLF, right? They are not going to get it. They, you see, they are just delusional right now. Why? Because they don't understand this is a spiritual thing. This is, a, this is biblical. The most High God is the one that's making sure that that's why you see EFF Malema is so frustrated. Andilem Kitana, he's so frustrated because I met Andilem Kitana and I showed him this. He rejected it. He didn't want to hear this. I met him in Rosebank and I explained to him the scriptures. He still doesn't want to get it. He, he rejected it. Guess what? Look how frustrated they are. You understand? Because we always just want to make complicated things. You understand that? Now, Watch this. Give me Ecclesiastes 7, verse 7 now. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. What did he say? Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. Mm -hmm. Come on. And a gift destroyeth the heart. So now the Lord is teaching us, listen, oppression will make a wise man mad. Remember, it says, he that is well-natured, he that is wise, you understand, will be aware thereof. So what I'm, I'm bringing all these precepts for you to see that 
You're supposed to be mad as hell, mad enough to what? To learn how to fight with the sword that the Lord has given us. The most that God has given us a weapon of war, the Bible. The Bible is not a book of fairy tales. No, the Bible is a book of war because we are at war. We are surrounded by these heathens. They are flourishing in wealth. They are oppressing and depressing us. You understand? So you're supposed to be mad because our people are, are mad out there through politics. They are using the same instrument that was created by their oppressors to fight the oppressor. What is that called? Delusion. You need something that the oppressor has no control over to fight the oppressor. That's the Bible. The Bible is the only weapon on this earth that is going to fight the oppressor. We keep the commandments, we get the kingdom, the nations are defeated and forever. You understand? So right now, we are mad. That's why now the Lord is forging us into an army. I need you men to ascend into that spirit, an army, a soldier. That's why we are soldiers of Christ. A soldier is always on one thing, the mission. And a soldier is always concerned with making sure that he knows how to wield his weapon. You understand? Give me that in Jeremiah real quick. Okay? Because some of you don't know what this is about. That's why you like to throw ten times, make me sick. Okay? You need to wake up. Okay? Watch this. Give me Jeremiah 51 verse 20. Read that thing. I'm going to show you what the Lord is trying to do. What the Lord is doing with us. You have to understand that thing. Read it. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 20. Go ahead. Thou art my battle axe. Thou art and my weapons. battle axe. Hold on. Battle axe. The Lord is talking to us. He says, you are my battle axe. You know what a battle axe is? That's a weapon of execution. A battle axe. The Lord says, that's what we are. A battle axe. Read that thing. Read that thing again, verse 20. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. Read. Thou art my battle axe mm -hmm. and weapons of war. Stop right there. You hear what the Lord is saying? It says, you men of Israel, you are my battle axe and weapons of war. We are the Moses God's weapon of war. And guess what? We have the sword in our hands to learn how to war. That's what the Lord says. I'm not going to drive these nations out because I want to teach you war. This is a spiritual war that we're in. You must learn how to fight. How to wield this weapon of war that the Lord has given unto us. You understand? That means you must study. Nobody must supposed to be forcing you to study. You understand? You're supposed to understand you're a soldier. You need to know how to wield this weapon of war. You must learn. You must be taught how to use it. You understand? Read. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations. Mm. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. You see what the Lord is saying? It says, because with you, Israelites, you men, it says, will I break in pieces the nations. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Great kingdoms. The Lord says, I'm going to use you, Israelites, to destroy these kingdoms. Listen, that's not a small job. That's a heavy responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. Watch this. Now, give me the book of Job 8 and 8. Job chapter 8, verse 8. Watch this. Hmm. The book of Job. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what happened in the past. I'm going to just give you a taste. So you can really, your spirit can be shogolozat. Okay, read that thing again. Read it. Job chapter 8 verse 8. Read. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, mm -hmm. and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. It says we must prepare ourselves for the search of our fathers. We must search our fathers, and our fathers are found in this Bible. You understand? Now watch this. Give me the book of Genesis chapter 14 verse 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Watch this. The book of Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Now at this point, our forefather Abraham had gone to retrieve his brother Lot. He was going to retrieve because Lot he was taken by those five kings that were fighting. Five kings versus four kings that were fighting. You understand? So now they took our, our forefather Lot, Abraham's nephew. 
Look what Abraham does. Watch this. Genesis 14, verse 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. Was what? Was taken captive. Stop right there. Because you read this all the time, but you never saw it like today. When Abraham was what? When, when, Lord, when, Lord, when Abraham's brother was what? That his brother was taken captive. Stop right there. His brother was taken captive. Is not our brothers in captivity taken captives? Are we not captives in this land? Yes, we are. We are captives in this land. Understand that thing. This is heavy stuff right here. Read that thing again, verse 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, mm -hmm. read, he armed his trained servants. Stop right there. What did he do? He armed his trained servants. He says, when Abraham discovered that his brother was taken captive, because before you came into this truth, right, you didn't know that you are, you are a slave. You didn't know that. You didn't know that you, uh, your people are taken captive by the kings of the earth. You didn't know that. Now the Lord says, let me lighten your spirit. Let me wake you up so you can see. Now you discover that, wait a minute, my people are in captivity. You understand? You see the next step? This is the next step. This is what you're supposed to do. That's why we have a camp, all praise to the Lord. Why? Because when we discover that, listen, wait a minute, our people are in slavery. So what is the next step? Read that part again. He did what? He armed his trained servants. He armed. He armed. That means he gave them weaponry. And he trained them. He trained these men. Abraham trained these men. He trained them. These men were not, they were not, they were not bums. No, these were warriors. He tra Abraham trained these men himself. He trained, he armed his trained servants. This is heavy right here. So guess what we're doing right now? You brothers, man, you need to see, you need to sink yourself in this Bible. Hold this. Give me, let me show you what Judah Maccabee did because he did the same thing. Okay, watch this. Give me that in second Maccabees. You see, let me show you something. Watch this. Second Maccabees chapter 3. Second Maccabees chapter 3 and verse 1. Watch this. Second Maccabees chapter 3 verse Hold 1. On. Before we do that, right? Hmm. Read verse 43 first for me. Read verse 43 for me. Second Maccabees chapter 3. Hmm. Verse 43. Come on. So there's no 43, sir. No, no, uh, I'm sorry. First Maccabees. First Maccabees 3. First Maccabees 3, verse 43. Yes, sir. First Maccabees, chapter 3, verse 43. Go ahead. They said one to another, mm. let us restore the decayed estates of our people and let us fight for our people and the sanctuary. That's the same mindset that our forefather Abraham had. So this is nothing new in Israel. This is normal. This is normal day-to-day -day stuff. You understand? It says, he said, let, he said, they said one to another, let us restore the decayed state of our people and let us fight for our people and the sanctuary. That's what Abraham did for his brother. He applied the royal, the royal law right there. That's what Judah Maccabee did. He applied the royal law. Next verse. Go ahead. Verse 44. Mm-hmm. Then was the congregation gathered together that they might be ready for battle. That they might be what? That they might be ready for battle. They might be ready for battle. Because it was a physical fight at this point. But today is a spiritual fight. But nonetheless, it's still a fight. Understand that? Read. And that they might pray mm. and ask mercy and compassion. You see, where the, the first, they knew where the source is. They knew if we are going to war, you better make sure that you speak to the most high. You go, you're about the, the war. You cannot do anything that is war related. The most high is not involved. You have to get the most high God involved. You have to get the Lord involved. You're going to war. The most high God is a mastermind of war. 
And he's the one that delivers enemies into our hands. He does that. He teaches us to fight. The Lord is the one that does that thing. You understand? That's why they prayed unto the Most High God and asked for mercy and compassion. You understand? Now, watch this. Read verse 1 now. First Maccabees 3 verse 1. We coming back to Genesis. I have not forgotten about Genesis. Go back to First Maccabees 3 verse 1. Read that. First Maccabees chapter 3 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Then his son Judas, called Maccabees, rose up in his stead. That's when Marathias had died now. Watch this. Come on. And all his brethren helped him. Stop right there. Now, this is, you need to, this is, this is when, when there's a war, you, you put aside whatever garbage you have, whatever issues you've got, there's war. Right now, that's the same thing. That's why I'm not supposed to see any brother just having a grudge about, uh, against another brother, having a quarrel, having the spirit of hatred. I don't want to see that garbage. We are at war. You put aside those things that the scripture says to do. You understand? You must put away all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. Like it says in 1 Peter 1. I mean, 1 Peter 2 verse 1. You have to do that because we are at war. There's no time for you. You have the spirit of hatred. Are you kidding? We are at war yet. There's no time for that stuff. Okay, read. And they fought with... No, no. Read verse 2 again. First Maccabees chapter 3 verse 2. Mm -hmm. And all his brethren helped him. And so did all they that helped with his father. Read. And they fought with cheerfulness the battle of Israel. They fought with cheerfulness the battle of Israel. So you mean to tell me that these men that were moving with Judah Maccabee, they were not trained? Of course they were trained. They understood war. They knew how to fight because the Lord taught, taught them how to fight. Likewise, so is the same thing this day. You understand? Who taught Abraham to fight? The Lord did that. And Abraham trained his servants to also know how to fight. That's the same thing today. We're doing the same thing in the camp. So that's why it's very important for you brothers to understand the importance of studying and applying. So you can know how to wield this weapon of war because if you don't, you will shoot yourself in the face and shoot another brother. We don't want that. Okay? We don't want that thing. Next verse. Verse 3. Come on. Verse 3. So he got his people great honor. That's exactly what we are doing. We fight, we're going to get our people great honor because right now we are dishonorable before these nations. But when on, on the Lord returns, we are going get, to get great honor because the Most High God is with us. Okay, come on. And he put on a breastplate as a giant mm. and, girt, and girt his warlike harness about him. Mm. And he made battles, protecting the host with his sword. That's it right there. Is, you see that part right there? It says, protecting the host with his sword. What is the sword today? The Bible is the sword today. You understand? So guess what? When people come to camp, people come into the, the school and all of that, when we are at camp, when we're teaching, that's what we are doing. We are protecting the host of God's army with the sword, with the Bible. That's why we have to teach them the law so they can repent. That's how we're protecting them with the sword. It's not a physical fight. It's a spiritual one. You understand? Go back to Genesis 14, verse 14. Because the same spirit that Judah Maccabee was moving in with his brothers that helped him is the same spirit that our forefather Abraham was moving in. Watch this. Genesis 14, verse 14 again. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Read. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, mm. he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, Born in his own house. Born in his own house. Go ahead. Born in his own house. 318. And pursued them unto Dan. So now you want to see, you see our forefather Abraham, he was a war machine. It says he armed his trained servants that were born in his house. 318 men. With 318 men, he went, he went, to destroy great armies that were greater than himself. Now, I want to show you something. 
Go back to First Maccabees, right? Read First Maccabees chapter three, verse eighteen. Let me show you the spirit that Judah Maccabee had, because where did he get it from? Our forefather Abraham. Our forefather Abraham had three hundred and eighteen servants. He is going against these great kingdoms that these great kings that went to war. These great kings they had armies, thousands, hundreds of thousands of armies. Now watch this. Now during the time of Judah Maccabee, we were fighting against the Greeks. You understand? Read that. First Maccabees three verse eighteen. First Maccabees chapter three verse eighteen. Read. Unto whom Judas answered. It is no you know hard what? matter. Wait, 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 wait. Read verse, read verse 16, okay? You know what? Start at verse 13. I like verse 13. Read down, okay? First Maccabees, chapter 3, verse 13. Go ahead. Now when Seron, a prince of the army of Syria, May a prince be the captain. Heard Hold say, on. a prince, when it says a prince means a captain of the army of Syria. Go ahead. Read. Let's see that Judas had gathered unto him a multitude and company of the faithful to go out with, war, with him to war. And now this is something I touched on last night about, you understand, you young upcoming leaders that you are being groomed to become leaders, you must, you must be faithful and loyal. It says... It says what, and it says what, when, 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 when Saron, he had that Judah Maccabee had gathered together a multitude and company of the faithful. You see that thing? You cannot go to war with a brother that is double-minded. You can't go to war to a brother that is not really here. He's one foot in the world. His other foot is up in here. He will get you killed. You understand? That's why he says company of the faithful to go out with him to war. The faithful. Read. He said, I will get me a name and honor in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. For I will go fight with Judas and them that are with him, who despised the king's commandments. Because Judas was not going to bow down to the king's commandment to follow Greek customs. Read. So he made him ready to go up. And there went with him a mighty host of the ungodly to help him. So Saron was being helped by a mighty host of the ungodly. You see that? You see the difference between Judas's army versus Saron's army? Read. And to be avenged of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Come on. And when he came near to the going up of Beth Horon, Judas went forth to meet him with a small company. Now, that's the key right there. That's the same thing Abraham did, didn't it? Abraham went to meet these kings with a small company, with a small army, with a small company of men. Small. You see how we are? You might think we are small. No, we're walking with an army. You might think we're small. We are not small. If you read the book of 2 Kings chapter 6 with Elisha and his servant, when he says, open his eyes, Lord, so he can see that we are not alone. We are not alone, brothers. Don't get it twisted. We are not alone. We have an army, millions of angels with us when we go to war. Understand that thing. Read. Who, when they saw the host coming to meet them, said unto Judas, how shall we be able, being so few, to fight against so great a multitude and so strong, mm. seeing we are ready to faint with fasting all this day? With what? With fasting all this day. One thing I can tell you is that the forefathers are back. If you are sleeping to that, shame on you. Go ahead. Verse 18. Uh -huh. Unto whom Judas answered. Now remember, verse 17 is the, comp the small company that was with Judah Maccabee. Okay? Next verse. They, they are saying, listen, are we going to be able to deal with these, these, arm, these great armies, seeing that we are what? We are faint with fasting all this day? Watch what Judas says. Read. And to whom Judas answered, It is no hard matter for many to be shut up in the hands of a few. He says this, it doesn't mean anything. That don't mean nothing. That great multitude, don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried about nothing. It says what? It says it is, not a, it is no hard matter for many to be shut up in the hands of a few. And that's why I want you brothers to, to, 
they are not this thing to marinate in your spirit. Okay, read. And with the God of heaven, it is all one. You see that thing? With the Most High God, it's all the same for him. Because the Most High is the one that delivered the, delivers enemies into our hands. He's the one that does it. You understand? So that's why it says, with the God of heaven, it is all one. It don't mean nothing. Read. To deliver with a great multitude or a small company. Next verse. Go ahead. For the victory of the battle standeth not in the multitude of an host, mm -hmm. but strength cometh from heaven. You see where the strength comes from? The most like God is the one that gives us strength. The Lord is the one that gives us this strength. You understand? De to deliver enemies into our hands. Go ahead. They come against us in much pride and iniquity to, to destroy us. Read. And our wives and children and to spoil us. You see that thing? Because they are always gunning for our wives and our children. Families. You know, that's why they are destroying the black nation. Separating the black woman from the black man. Teaching the black woman that she's better than the black man. Yes. That's what they do. Read. But we fight for our lives and our laws. Mm, that's some heavy stuff right there. We fight for our lives and our laws. Read. Wherefore, the Lord himself will overthrow them before our face. Mm. And as for you, be not afraid of them. Now read that part again. As for what? And as for you, be ye not afraid of them. Be ye not afraid of them. Don't be fearful, brothers. Don't be fearful. We are at war and the Lord is with us. Fear nothing. That's what the Lord is showing us here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Watch this. Go back to Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14 again. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Go ahead. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, mm. he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, mm -hmm. 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Come on. And he divided us and he divided himself against him. So now these 318 trained servants that was armed by Abraham is as he divided himself against them. Go ahead. He and his servants by night. By what? By night. By night. He went by night. So, because I think we had a class where we, there was a book that we were showing. So the book goes into the details of Abraham's, um, Abra Abraham's conquest here. Yeah. You understand? Abraham's campaign. That Abraham, he went against these kings that took his brother captive. It says he went by night. That means Abraham understood night vision warfare. He understood that. And he came up with that. Night vision commando. He understand that he understood that. That's why today you see Esau's military be using that in their armies and all of that. They learned it from our forefather Abraham. This is heavy stuff. He says he did what? And he divided yeah. himself against him. Uh -huh. He and his servants by night. And smote them. And did what? And smote them. He killed them. He killed them with a small company. 318 versus hundreds of thousands of armies. Read. And smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Come on. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot. Read. And his goods... And the women also, and the people. Now, this is, you see, our forefather Abraham, our forefather Abraham didn't play games. He knew how to fight. You understand? He knew how to fight. So this was a physical war, by the way, that was going on here. You understand? This was a physical war. Now, watch this. I'm going to show you something. I'm almost done. Give me the book of Matthew 10, verse 1. Matthew. I wanted to go to um, First Chronicles 11, First Chronicles 12. I'm going to deal with that some other time. Okay? Give me that in Matthew 10, verse 1. Watch this. 
The book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1. Go ahead. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against the unclean spirits mm -hmm. to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So now this is the 12 disciples, right? Christ says, Christ, he called unto them, he gave them power against unclean spirits. So when we go to camp, brothers, what do you think the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is doing? The Spirit of the Lord is working through us because of what? That power to heal unclean spirits. We go to camp, we teach our people to repent because Christ has given us the power against unclean spirits that are plaguing our people. Smoking, you understand? Dealing with prostitutes, you understand? Hating your brother. Those are unclean spirits. When we bring out the scriptures, we are healing our people against our, those unclean spirits that have plague in them. Understand that, Ray? You know verse what? Two. Before you get that, now I want to show you something, right? Watch this. Give me John 18, verse 10. John chapter 18. John 18. Like, remember, this is a, this is this is spiritual. This is a spiritual war now. Okay. I want to show you something. Give me John. Because Christ, he didn't walk with men that were. The, he didn't walk with simps. Christ didn't have simps around him. Christ, let me say that again in case I started. Christ did not have simps around him. He didn't, have, there was no simp in Christ's camp. There was no simp. Understand that. Read that. John 18, verse 10. John, really? chapter, eight, John chapter 18, verse 10. Go ahead. Now, Simon Peter. Having a sword, drew it mm -hmm. and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So you see what the apostle, what type of skill do you have to have to chop off a man's right ear and not hit his shoulder and not hit his head? You need to understand that the apostle Peter, he was mighty with the sword. He chopped off the high priest's right ear. He cut it off with a sword. So can you, you have to imagine that you have to visualize this thing. You must visualize it and see like what type of skill the apostle Peter had. He was extremely skillful when it comes to war. Now, read the next verse. Go ahead. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father had given me, shall I not drink it? Now, the apostle Peter was doing that to protect Christ, right? Now, Christ died. He, he sacrificed himself for us. Christ is gone, if you read Acts 1 and 9. Now, you think now, now it's time to, pull the, to take the sword out of the sheath now. Because at this point, Christ was with them. Now, Christ is when he went to the Father. He left us with, he's comforting us now with his spirit. So the apostle Peter now, guess what? Because they are back. Now it's time to take the sword out. Now it's time to take the sword out. Watch this. Give me that in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Read that. 2nd book of Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Read. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but Stop mighty right there. through. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what is the Apostle Paul teaching us? The Apostle Paul is teaching us that we are at war. That's why it says, for the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. Because we don't use guns. We don't use knives. You understand? We don't be stabbing people. We don't set people on fire. We don't do none of that stuff. You understand? But it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what is the weapon of our warfare? Hmm. We coming back here. Give me Hebrews 4 verse 12. This is the weapon of our warfare. You understand? The weapon of our warfare are not carnal. Watch this. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Brother Haggai, are you fine now with the sound? Let me hear you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Brother Bezalel. We appreciate you. Read that. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
Come on. For the word of God is quick and powerful mm. and sharper than any two-edged sword. You see what the... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Did we not notice that when we were at camp? You know, brother, be coming to hear the word. You will start to bring the scriptures out. Listen, out of nowhere, somebody's going to come there offended. What do you think happened? What do you think? Zorro happened. Okay. Remember that sister that we read the, the law that says women are not supposed to wear pants? She jumped out. Out of nowhere, she got hit by the sword of Zorro. You understand? Because the weapon, the, the word of God is quick. You bring, you bring the law out, it's quick. It hits to the bone. It says, for the word of God is quick and is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the weapon of our warfare, the word of the Most High God. This is the weapon of war that the Most High God, he gave unto us when he woke us up in these last days to fight because these nations that are around about us, they are making us mad as hell. They are frustrating us. The Lord said, don't worry. I'm going to teach you how to channel your frustrations. You're going to come back into this book. You're going to learn it. You're going to apply it. That's how you want to war. Because this is a spiritual war. You understand? Read. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Read. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Haven't you seen that at camp? You ever see that on the streets when we teach? It says the word of God. It says what is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why a lot of people when they come there. They always. The, Lord, the word of God will discern their thoughts and their intents in their mind. The things they're really thinking. The Lord when the law comes out. They're going to jump up out of nowhere. They'll be sitting on a, ta on a chair. They'll be jumping up. They, they pretend like they are listening. Before you know it, they are in front of you. Now they're going to come. They want to go against what the, the Bible says. Because the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is the weapon of our warfare right here. Go back to 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 again. Now that we understand what the Lord is teaching us. Because the apostle Peter, he had the physical sword. Guess what? We have a spiritual sword now. You understand? The Bible, the word of the most high God, the laws, his law, statutes, and his commandments. Read that. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Mm -hmm. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Do you see that thing? It says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The, our people, they have strongholds in their minds. Christmas is a stronghold. You understand? Valentine's Day is a stronghold. New Year is a stronghold. Bad days is a stronghold. Women wearing pants, that's a stronghold. Men wearing dresses, that's a stronghold. You understand? Buying and selling and cooking on the Sabbath day, that is a stronghold in the minds of our people. Why Jesus is a stronghold in the minds of our people? And we must cast it down with the word of God. You understand? Read. Verse 5. Mm -hmm. Casting down imaginations. You see that thing? We have to cast down the imaginations in our people's mind. Because our people imagine that it's okay for, for women to wear miniskirt and should show have a cleavage. No, it's not okay. The black man might imagine that it's okay for him to shave off his beard and wear pink shoes and sag his pants where his underwear is showing. No, no, that's not okay. You understand? We must destroy those imaginations and feed them with the word of God. Right? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Because white Jesus exalts itself. Christianity, which is white supremacy, exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's why when we teach that white Jesus is a lie, our people say color doesn't matter. What does that mean? They have, they, the white Jesus is a stronghold in the minds of our people. Our people are under a spell. You understand? Read. And bringing into captivity every thought to the, obe to the obedience of Christ. So we must bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So all these wicked imaginations our people have, 
we must bring them into obedience. You must bring them into captivity to the obedience of Christ. They must obey the gospel. And our job, brothers, we are the army of the Mosai. Our job is to use this weapon the right way so our people can repent and get delivered when the Lord returns. That's our job. We are God's army. Give me that in Exodus 6.26. Exodus chapter 6, verse 26. Come on. These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their armies. According to their armies, because we are the army of the Most High. We are God's army. And in these last days, the Lord is going to, he's assembling us into that mighty weapon of war. Like we read in Jeremiah 51. That's what the Lord is doing. And I need you brothers to understand that thing so you can, but you can be foldable. You can be malleable. You can be teachable to receive this word. So you can be that mighty weapon of war. You understand? Watch this. Give me the book of Ezekiel. Okay. Give me Ezekiel 37 verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 10. Go ahead. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Mm -hmm. And the breath came into them. And they lived and stood up upon their feet. An exceeding great army. An exceeding great army. That's what the Lord is doing with us. The Lord is forging us into an army. An exceeding great army. Because our people, we are scattered everywhere when we always outnumber the other nations. So when that, right now, the most High God is going to bring our people in at the hands of a few. When we go out there in numbers, thousands and thousands of us, the world is not going to believe what they are seeing. The world is not going to believe what they are seeing. You need to understand that. You have to be patient and allow the laws of God to build your spirit up. You understand? Read verse 10 again. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 10. Come on. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Mm -hmm. And the breath came into them and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. An exceeding great army. So guess what? That exceeding great army, the Lord is forging us into that exceeding great army. And I need you men to be ready for that thing. That's why I need you brothers to study. Okay. I need you brothers to study this Bible. Watch this. Give me Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 verse 14. Watch this. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 14. Go ahead. Fear not, thou worm Jacob. Mm, thou what? Thou worm Jacob. It says fear not, thou worm Jacob. We are a worm now. Because why? We are in captivity. We are catching hell. We don't have no power. That's why the Lord is calling us a worm. Watch this. Go ahead. Fear not, the worm Jacob, mm. and ye men of Israel. Come on. I will help thee, saith the, the Lord. Lord says, the Lord says he's going to help Jacob. So we have nothing to fear. You understand? Read. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Come on. Behold. I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. You see what the Lord says he's going to do? It says, listen, it says, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. The Lord says, I'm going to give you power. Right now, the Lord is giving us what? He's giving us his way. He's giving us power spiritually. You understand? To fight against the evils that we experience. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The Lord is giving us power to overcome those things. First and foremost, to get our minds right first. Read. Thou shalt thresh the mountains. The mountain is the government, the great kingdoms. Read. And beat them small. And do what? And beat them small. We're going to beat these great kingdoms and these great nations. We're going to beat them small. They're not going to be able to stand before us when the Lord is with us. Go ahead. And shall make the hills as chaff. They're going to make the, these great hills as chaff. Read. 
Thou shalt fend him. That we shall what? The, thou shalt fend him. We shall fend them. Go ahead. Thou shalt fend him, and the wind shall carry them away. The wind shall carry them away. Go ahead. And the whirlwind shall scatter them. Mm. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. And we shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. The Lord is forging us into an army. And the most High God is giving us, is giving us the greatest weapon on earth, the Bible. This is a spiritual sword. We read in the book of Hebrews how powerful this Bible is. We read it. The Lord is saying, listen, do not take that book for granted. This is the greatest weapon on earth. And guess what? We must know how to wield it. Watch this. Give me Zechariah chapter 9. Give me Zechariah chapter 9 verse 12. Watch this. Zechariah 9 verse 12. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 12. Mm-hmm. Turn you to the stronghold. The stronghold is the Bible. The most High God is commanding us to turn to the stronghold. The stronghold is the Bible. Read. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Because we're always hoping. We're always hoping that things will get better. We, we are prisoners of hope. And the, the nations are giving us false hope. Politics is a false hope. Christianity, false hope. Economic freedom, economic freedom in our lifetime, strong. That says that that thing right there, that's a first false hope. We're always hoping. The Lord says, No, 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 you don't have to do that. You just put your faith in me, and I will I will make you a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. You worm Jacob. Fear not. Read. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. The Lord says he's going to render double unto us. The Lord is going to reward us double. Read. When I have bent Judah for me. Stop right there. When I have bent Judah for me as a what? A weapon of war. Go ahead. Fill the bow with Ephraim. And fill the bow with Ephraim. So now the Lord is what? He's creating a bow and an arrow. He says, when I've, when I've bent Judah for me, and fill the bow with Ephraim. So imagine somebody that is skillful in archery. You understand? If you read the book of First Chronicles, you read about that in First Chronicles chapter 12. You, read, you see all the tribes with all their skills, Gad, Reuben, Asher, Naphtali. You understand? Read. And raised up thy sons. Mm -hmm. oh, and raised up thy sons, O Zion. Come on. Against thy sons, O Greece. You see what the Lord is doing? The Lord says, I'm doing this because you're going to go against the Grecians. Who's that? Edom, Idumia, Esau. Read. And maybe as a sword of a mighty man. Mm, that's some beautiful stuff right there. The Lord says, he says, I'm going to make you as a what? He says, I'm going to make thee as the sword of a mighty man. Judah and Ephraim, all 12 come together. We are, listen, we are unmovable. Right. And the Lord shall be seen over them. The most high God is going to be seen over us. The Lord will never be seen over us in politics. The Lord will never be seen over us in Christianity and religion. You understand? In democracy. The Lord will never be seen over us because that's not the spirit of the Lord in there. Right. And the Lord shall be seen over them. Mm -hmm. And his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. The, his arrows shall, shall go forth as the lightning. Come on. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet. Mm. And shall go with the whirlwind of the south. The whirlwind of the south is going into the chariots. You understand? Is going into the chariots. Read on verse 15. The Lord of hosts shall defend him. The Lord of the most high God is going to defend us. Come on. And they shall devour mm. and subdue with sling stones. Come on. And they shall drink and make a noise as though as through wine. And they shall be filled like bowls mm -hmm. and as the corners of the altar. So now the Lord is going to use us to destroy this nation. Once the Lord is satisfied with his killings, 
Guess what? He's going to say, now my servants, you go out there and have some fun. Me, I want a sword. Yeah, I don't want a gun. Sword. That's the best instrument of war because he's you to see chopping bodies, cutting heads off. Yeah. That's therapy right there for the saints. You understand? That's therapy right there. Go ahead. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. Mm. For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his, upon his land. Jerusalem, come on. For, na- for how great is his goodness, mm. and how great is his beauty. Really? Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. Amen to that thing. The Lord is with us. The Lord will be with. The Lord was with us back then. The Lord is with us this day. Understand that. Okay. I'm going to end that last right here. All praises to the Most High. Uh, let's break bread. First Corinthians 11 verse 23. For the sake of time, I had to rush this class. I really needed to go into a lot of stuff, but all praise to the Most High God. First Corinthians 11 23. Let's read that. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same man also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man ex- examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 